Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the fourth video in the JX36 overhaul, a system of house rules for Global War 1936 version 2. It is um, house rules. It's not in any way endorsed by historical board gaming. It's something I did completely independently of them in 2017 prior to any involvement or association with historical board gaming. I have shared the ideas herein with, with um, HBG and Doug when I worked with them that brief year as well as a host of other ideas that um, aren't going to be present here. And um, yeah, so I'm not saying, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say is that these ideas are out there. Now, I want to also state that good ideas tend to rise to the surface, whereas bad ideas fall by the wayside. No one wants to propagate a bad idea. So if you see any coincidental similarities between version 3 and this, it's purely coincidental. And I personally believe that this rule set that I have here, this house rule set, has zero or nothing to do with historical board gaming. You know, that they worked completely independent of each other. That's my two cents. So let's do a quick overview of what the pages are. So we're on page four, but this is what we'll, we'll cycle to there. So the first page was dealing with the home front, with alliances, who you have alliances with, kind of the cost of breaking and what the alliances mean. Kind of an event system of how to create more alliances and how to annul certain alliances as well. <clears throat> In the cases of places like Italy, it'll show a series of events to get them from kind of the allied front, which was called the Stressa front, I believe it was called, and eventually get into the Axis camp. So those are the sequence of events that Italians can do. It's how to declare war nations and the penalties therein, as well as lend lease, how to lend lease, how to block lend lease, and uh, how lend lease moves around on the map, and what you can lend lease as well. Second page dealt with more house rules. It also dealt with turn phases, Dynamic air war house rules, so that's that's pretty interesting, but we'll deal with that later on. Victory points are dealt with here. Um, pretty simplistic, similar to what we have in the vanilla game. And then we have all these different house rule sets here. De delayed deployment of production, shipping base hopping rule, contested territory, army and navy units versus air units, peacetime naval intent, generals and admirals, withdrawing and surrendering, partisans uprising and civil war, and dynamic supply. And we have a restructured kind of turn order of which nations go first. Breaking away from the system that was first introduced by Axis and Allies, probably classic Axis and Allies, and kind of been, been held to since then, and even into Global War 36, you know, it's being held to this kind of idea of <clears throat> historically who went first can act first, that kind of thing. So this is hopefully a more efficient structure. Now, this page here, page three, deals with some fun stuff. Except for this oil wars section here, this column in gray on the right hand side, I say feel free to ignore that. <laughs> uh, that's just copy pasted from HPG's expansion of global, um, what's it called? The oil wars expansion, which I like, I like the concept of having oil in the game. I just can't think of a, well, <clears throat> I don't think HPG came up with a good system to employ just yet. And I'm not alone in that. There's a few other, um, um, YouTubers that also feel the same thing, and, and lots of comments from the community as well. Wintermute, check out his channel. He will eventually post up <clears throat> a series of videos about the oil wars that he would design, how to incorporate oil into his game. And I think it's brilliant design that he's come up with, so check out his channel. And, and uh, yeah, and, and also, if you guys have any suggestions on how other people do oil, and um, a good system. Put it down in the comments as well. I'm always interested to see different people's ideas. So this deals with more what you see as, as a normal kind of reference sheet, the income. So you have peacetime, wartime, peacetime income increases, one-time events, peace and war bonuses. You can, can get one in war and in peace because you should be able to benefit from certain things in war and peace. <clears throat> Wartime bonuses are listed here, and some of them are not finite, uh, production point benefits. Some of them are such as plus two escort modifier. And on the right column here, we have just some special national rules for different nations, you know, for the, in this case, Britain. Commando, Royal Marines, and ferry biplanes are unique, and commandos are unique units that have been introduced for the British in this expansion. And we also deal with unit experience gain. This was a, a small feature in Global War 36 version. And I believe it was just for, was it the Soviets? But I expanded it to encompass all nations. Um, I'm not absolutely happy with it. I think the less die rolls, the better. 
in this case, there's a die roll of that, but it's hard to work with the random chance without die rolls. Okay, and that catches up to where we are, and now we move on to the next stage, which is going to be kind of facilities, bases, infrastructure, and basically things that you construct. So let's take a look at what that entails. So facilities here, we have an anti-aircraft value, so three dice at three, I drew that really poorly. Three dice at three, that's this one here. I'm gonna just draw a line on top. This one here is bonus given by the factory, hit points and cost, cost to build. Here in green, we have things that are unlocked with technology and the yellow stands for the cool thing about that unit. It's best highlighted feature. It's, it's um, the thing, the reason that you would get that unit. Now I've played a little bit of version two now, not much. I only have one game under my belt, I think with version two perhaps a bit more, uh, maybe two, yeah, two games under my belt with version two. But here we have, uh, sorry, version three. Um, in my experience, no, actually one, one game under my belt with version three, sorry. In my experience, medium factories were not used very much. Nobody built a medium factory and kept it on a medium factory. You either upgraded your medium factory to major or you kept miners. Now one person was a CCP who built a medium factory. And I predict, uh, I think the only reason they needed it is because they're like, well, look, we're, we're, we're not going to build more than three units at a time or four or five units at a time. We don't need the production capacity of a major factory, but it's nice to have a little bit more. So that's why they built a medium factory. But everybody else upgraded theirs to a major factory or kept miners. So if I remember correctly, you can't build medium factories in version three in outside of your homeland. So realistically, outside your homeland, you build miners. Inside your homeland, you build majors for that technological bonus. I feel like medium factories are just another unit to, to have to have in your collection, and it's not always uh, not the best unit to have anyways. I don't think it should have been included in the game, but that's just my opinion, and <laughs> I'm allowed to have an opinion. One thing I really do like that version 3 did is for every bombing aircraft attacking, you have a dice roll which succeeds at a 3. I like that. That's brilliant. Um, the previous system used to be three dice at three for everything. I don't like that. <laughs> I like this system much better. But here we have it. So Minor Factory would have a three dice at three defense. It would give a bonus of one, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Have 10 hit points and cost 10 bucks. So this price might be a little steep for some of these, but there's a reason for that. It's highlighted features. You can build one unit, two once you get this industrialization technology, and you can elect IPP if no units are built. Let me talk about that for a second. So my theory is this, those factories, what are they producing? Well, in peacetime, if they're not producing ammunition, if they're not producing rifles, they're not just going to be sitting there spinning their wheels idle. You know, they're probably going to be producing something, um, maybe tin can, ta cans of tuna, maybe toasters, maybe, you know, like that kind of thing. It could be a whole wealth of different things that they're producing kind of as commodities, you know, commercial goods. Uh, whatever you want to call it, just things that they produce for money. And so the reason behind this, to introduce a bit more money into the game, I made it that you could collect IPP if you're not building any units that turn. So if you're not building any units that turn, you get to build, uh, you get one buck bonus that turn. That's really nice and handy, I think. One buck bonus is, is um, nice. And that's only if you don't build any units, up until you get this industrialization technology, and then you collect IPP for every minor factory you have, regardless. I like this because it means that you don't actually have to be expansionistic necessarily and can still kind of increase your income over time. That's partially why the cost is increased a little bit. I believe it in version 2 is 5 and 5 anyways. In version 3 it's 8 bucks for a minor factory. So that's why um, here in this case I'm pretty happy with the 5 and 5 because you have uh, you get that one buck out of there. You can build anywhere with or without a territory value. This is just a, how to upgrade, basically the same function as a minor factory until upgraded. Major factory can produce five units, up to eight once you get this industrialization technology, and you get three IPP for that, three IPP um, as bonus, right? So that's nice, built in national territory with a territory value. So you can't build it in, um, it, you have to build national homeland with a territory value. It has to have some existing structure already. The reason with that is that you don't want them to be building, like say if it's Canada, you don't want the Canadians to be building a major factory way up north in the tundra <laughs> where nobody can bomb them, nobody can cause them any trouble. You don't want that. You want them to be building somewhere where there's population, where there's industry, where there's resources. 
and that's why it has to be built with a territory value. And you would get three bucks out of that. Now, in version three, they increased, uh, sorry, decreased the amount of time it took to build something down to three stages, which I think is a brilliant idea. Uh, it's really, really good. I, I like that inclusion. In this, we still have four stages, five stages, sorry, five stages to get that. And just because you have money coming in and that kind of thing. And also, anyways, we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> it might encourage players to build a miner first and then go to a major or something like that, right? And thereby collecting two bucks um, and only missing out one. Next, we go on to bases. Now, bases, well, first of all, not all of it's... Okay, so oil reserve. So those are basically oil tanks and such. If we're playing with this, uh, this is pretty much from the Oil Wars by HPG. I'm not going to talk about it too much. Research stations is something that may have come up from the Atomic... Uh, what's it called? Atomic expansion for Global War 36 Revision 2. Basically, in this case, this is how you do all your research in the game. Every research station would would simply uh, be um, equivalent of like Pinamunda, a research station in Germany, or a research station in you know America or whatever. Right? It's these kind of distinctive locations that uh, you know are separate from everything else that you could theoretically bomb out of the air and um, and and put them out of action for that turn. I quite like how version three made major factories tie in with with research. It simplifies things, and makes it a little bit more efficient. <clears throat> so quite nice. Um, I've said this before, I think, but uh, every board game has three factors, three major, major factors. Complexity, time added, and enjoyability. Now, for me, I think complexity depends on where you are in life. As I get older, I want less time added because I can't afford my time right now with having a wife and kid. So I want less time added, but still I want enjoyability. But sometimes, by having less time added, you need to decrease complexity. And that's why I like this major factory that uh, that uh, HBG came up with, with the research, research roles. It simplifies things to some degree. It's nice. Anyways, this is how you would do your research in this game. You get maximum of one per territory. So that's kind of nice. You have to, you know, you, uh, you have to spread out your, your research stations so that they can each be kind of... You can't capture a stack of five research stations in one attack, that kind of thing and also makes them more liable to be bombed. You know, if they have them spread out, in the case of Britain, you have um, a research station in Scotland, um, Upper England, and Lower England, or whatever, right? Three research stations there. Now, a person might say, well, hang on, shouldn't they have more than three? Well, the British Commonwealth all feeds into that technological pool, and so therefore, that's the way that goes. You know, Canada could assist and such. Airfields, one dice at three, damage of seven, Extend moon for all aircraft, and it grants scramble to all aircraft stationed in airfield. Now, in version 2, you didn't have scramble in the same way we had here. Scramble in version 2 is similar to Axis and Allies, where you could only scramble to adjacent sea zones. In this version of the game, I made it so you can scramble to all sea and land areas. 100%. And, and, um, and if you guys doubt that this predates version 3, <laughs> look at my records I put on Axis and Allies. That, that stuff is put up there in 2017 or something like that, right? Prior to version 3 coming out. So, <clears throat> and it's not a new idea. Other people had come up with the idea as well. Okay, so radar. You unlock radar with this tech. It's called radar application. So it allows scramble at night. So that's another little thing. You could do your bombing missions at night too. To areas, to adjacent areas via airfield. So you have to build a radar base. So, um... Yeah, a radar base and an airfield will both combine and you'll be able to scramble to adjacent areas. You'll be able to scramble on enemy combat and non-combat move. So that means if the <clears throat> if the Germans are shifting troops from, say, um, Norway to Normandy, then you can attack them in their non-combat move as they go by. You can detect that they're moving. Submarine pens are the next step. Enemy gains negative one malice. Now, malice is uh, a bonus and a malice are opposites. One is a positive thing, so it's like, it's weird to say a negative one bonus. <laughs> so negative one malice versus subs in adjacent C zones. Enemy gains negative one versus subs in adjacent C zones. So it's, it's, if you control the submarine pen, your enemy would gain negative one when, you're when they're attacking your subs in adjacent C zones. It's also a naval base for subs, and you could also harbor your subs. We'll talk about that momentarily. I should address up here that up here we have, <clears throat> I'll draw this out. Here we have anti-aircraft, anti-ship, 
hit points and cost. Okay, naval port. Now, in version 2, Global War 36, you only had three types of bases, basically. Sub-bases, naval ports, and shipyards. Now we have, I think, six, including dry docks, shipyards, major minor dry dock, major minor shipyard, major minor ports, and also major minor submarine base. So eight. Uh, at least eight. <laughs> okay. Um, so naval ports are the next one up. Grounds operational range, which is a new feature as well that we'll talk about on when we deal with the, the navies. We kind of dealt with it up top as well, but we'll deal with it later on. Plus one plus one move for all ships. Build all ships barring battleships and carriers. So you can use the naval ports to build ships, but you can't build battleships and carriers. You can upgrade a port to a fortified shipyard. So that's what it is. And we go naval shipyards. So naval shipyards are fortified shipyards. That's essentially what it is. I made shipyards basically fortified. I figured by in World War II they're going to have some defenses of some kind, um, regardless if it's... Uh, you get the idea. You'll have protected harbors for your shipyards and that kind of thing. So shipyards grant operational range and plus one for all ships, same as naval bases. You can build all ships, including um, battleships and carriers, and allows the harboring of ships. So this has a three dice at three and also a one dice at three against um, <clears throat> against ships. Okay, it cost 15. It takes four turns to build, though. Now keep in mind, in this version of the rules, there's three turns per year instead of four turns per year. So that's a... Um, yeah, that's, that's why things take a little bit longer. So let's talk about these ships first in this naval port idea, or sh fortified shipyard. Naval shipyard defends harbored ships with three harbor gun off-map units. So they're units, they're not, they're not ingrained in the shipyard. They're basically existing uh, as a separate kind of feature that each roll each round at 1d12 at 3. So it's not like anti-aircraft where they uh, roll each round, oh, sorry, where they roll once and that's it. In this case, they roll 1d12 at 3 and each round as guns. Each gun repairs at a 3 buck IPP. So that means you could take them as casualties as well. So if you have a navy coming into your port, you'll be able to battle it out against the the, the ship guns, basically. Uh, sorry, the harbor guns, and battle it out. And you could take casualties on your, sh on your guns as well, your um, harbor guns. All aircraft bombing harbored fleets, so fleets in a harbor, must pass the base anti-aircraft fire, this 3 dice at 3. Submarines and air attacks against harbored fleets gain a plus one attack due to the fleet's inability to maneuver freely in harbor waters. Now this is sim similar to that um, Toronto raid, remember, how the British bombed the Italian fleet. So they want to have some advantages for the attack in this case. Fleets in harbor must be marked with a harbored marker. That's essentially it. So my thinking is this. Um, perhaps there should have been a negative to the defender if you're in harbor but then that makes it a little bit difficult i played global war 1914 with um general hand grenade panzer king and one of my friends and uh, we found in that game they did have a feature for being in port but we found it was kind of it didn't bring too much to the table it made everybody all the time being in port so i think there should be some benefits and some some downsides of being at port Perhaps if you're in port, you don't. As if you're a harbored ship, you don't get your plus one move from that base. Now that could be a feature behind it. Um, but perhaps a defending fleet in there is also going to get a negative. So say, for instance, you have a shipyard, and it's uh, it's in like a protected cove, coast, whatever, right? And you have your docks here, and you have your fleets in the water sailing about, <clears throat> right? You have, you have three or four in the harbor, friendly ships in the harbor, and you have your three harbor guns. Now, perhaps half of these crews are on shore or something, or a quarter of their crews are on shore doing whatever, so perhaps they should operate at a negative one malice. And perhaps the attacking force, you know, you don't want them to be too weak then, so perhaps the attacking force should have a negative as well, because yes, the defender have these, uh, these uh, harbor guns, but perhaps the attacking force should be limited to how many ships they can bring into the harbor at a time. So since it theoretically bottlenecks in a harbor, perhaps you could only send in three enemy ships per turn, per combat round, or say four, four enemy ships per combat round. 
and the subsequent round bring another four. You know, whoever survives the first round carries on to the next round. Aircraft, of course, can be unlimited as they get into there, but I think that would kind of be an interesting way of doing it, where, yes, the defending fleet operates at a negative one, yes, the defending fleet has a bonus for these three extra kind of units, harbor guns that are, are helping to fight, and uh, perhaps the attacking force is also limited on what they can do. Or you could extend it and say, well, perhaps the ones attacking from outside, so only three of them operate without a malice, you know, uh, sorry, go in, uh, three enemy ships can go in and engage this fleet, but the ones outside operate at a negative two malice, where they're bombing from a distance, and so therefore they're not getting the best range they want to, to bomb that fleet in there. And that would make things a little bit more dynamic, where you, <clears throat> the attacking force is suffering a negative, the defending force is suffering a negative, but you can each turn um, dribble in troops into the harbor and take advantage of the weakness of the interior fleet. Plus, your air attack would also get a plus one attack there as well. That would symbolize as that would be similar to the Toronto Raid and really help things out in some capacity. Now I'm not saying that's the answer to it, and that's not what's written here, but that's just a idea as I've had floating in my head since that point. Okay, that deals with that. Now let's quickly take a look at C uh, subpens. Subpens are something similar to that. You know, they can be in harbor, but let's read it out. Subpens grant a negative one malice to all enemy ships. Uh, all enemies in adjacent sea zones attacking friendly lone subs. So I list lone subs in here, and perhaps it shouldn't say lone subs, but the idea is that the, the friendly power, the owner of the sub pen, wants to keep his subs a little bit spread out. You know, you don't want to just create this massive fleet of of, uh, of submarines that you know can linger there and, and uh, fend off everything because everything else attacking is a negative one. Sub pens allow harboring subs, which kind of functions similar to this protecting them from being scouted from the air. So submarines may raid and harbor if done in the same turn. So as we know, um, you can't be scouted, i sorry, subs operate a little differently where they can submerge. So in this case, being scouted from the air effectively protects them 100% from being attacked um, at all. Submarines may raid and harbor if done at the same turn. So that can, means that they're, they're impossible to sink those submarines. The only way to prevent them from being sunk <clears throat> the only pr way to uh, sorry the only way to prevent them from from raiding is to put a bunch of escorts out there to prevent them from attacking uh, those adjacent sea zones so if for instance you had them off the coast of Brittany or yeah Brittany if you had a submarine pen there those German subs because they'd probably be German one of them anyways goes out and raids that sea zone and comes back so the only way to defend against that is by having an escorting vessel there that can engage that submarine when it comes out. That's the idea there. So it kind of strengthens submarines a little bit, makes sub pens a little bit better. Now, uh, you can still attack the ships in the sub pens. Uh, can you? Maybe not, because you can't be scouted from the air. So you can't because you're going to get this negative one malice. But theoretically, you could bomb... Sorry, you could bomb for three damage. You could theoretically bomb that submarine pen and thereby, um, you know, do two attacks. One attack for the bombing run to damage that sub pen so it's no longer functioning, and then attacking that, um, and then using the rest of your resources to attack the submarine there. So that would work as a little bit of a workaround to that system. That's why it's so cheap here, or five bucks. I guess it's not super cheap, but it's cheap enough, right? You know that you could, um, you could do that, and you could easily repair it as well. And <clears throat> that submarine can be gauged for that one turn, and then submerge, and then there's nothing that opponent can do about it, and in the meantime, that sub pen could be repaired. That's the idea there. Whether it works or not, well, it seemed to work okay, but I'm sure I could poke a few holes in it here and there. Let's deal with the rest of this. Nuclear stuff is basically lifted from the expansion by historical board gaming, so a lot of this will probably change, or would have probably changed. Um, it works, but it's, it's uh, yeah, I'm not sure how well it works. It's one of those things that adds complexity, but not with sufficient enjoyment. So I wish, I think HBG should find a way to kind of make it a simpler system, similar to what they do with major factories and, and technology. I think that would make sense. Supplies. Now, supplies is the last resource. One supply for six units. Use to upgrade unit. Transport weight is equal to one unit. So that basically means if you are encircled in a territory, you can use one of your tokens for supply to supply six units. So that's quite nice. You know, if you're in Stalingrad, let's say, um, yeah, you want to have that. And so therefore you could theoretically have, uh, who is it, Goring, 
ship a whole bunch of these supply tokens since you could transport them um, each turn you could use your cargo planes or whatever um, maybe not cargo planes I don't remember if I have cargo planes in this to ship one supply each turn to kind of keep Stalingrad supplied that kind of thing <clears throat> all right so that deals with that let's take a look at the next thing rail work so this uh, is uh, some of it's lifted off of H HBG build railways on borders between territories cost this is the cost when crossing mountains that's the idea there it's a cost of five now in JX 36 I have more than more than mountain terrain there's gonna be kind of open rough and mountainous jungle and see a city terrain so you know it, it changes a little bit with what's all there let me quickly say that this has some confusion in it as well say if one territory is open terrain and one territory is mountain terrain do you pay since it's built on the border do you build half of it for three and half of it for five or do you build it for five it makes sense they build it for five but I could see you know I could confuse myself in this regards right well, if you say you know well half of it is on open terrain so it should be at you know 1.5 and half of it's on rough terrain so it should be 2.5 so 2.5 plus 1.5 you know that will bring you up to four bucks if you build it on that border so there's a little way of tricking myself because it's this is the cost when crossing mountain borders but what if the border is not mountainous completely mountainous what if one side's plain and the other side is firmly in the mountains okay um, look at Romania if you have any confusion there <laughs> okay rail station increase rail capacity in rail network by plus one maximum of one per territory build in highest IPP territory so this I thought was was a good way of getting around certain features so say if you want to increase the capacity of um, the rail capacity that Germany has in in Europe well you build a couple of railway stations now you could say like I, I want to build my railway station far enough from civilization for, far enough from the bombing range of, of British bombers or US bombers so I'm gonna build it a little bit far back I'm gonna build it way back you know in Slovakia well you can't do that because you have to build it in the highest IPP territory you have a base value of say four um, rail rail already at, in for Germany and you increase that by one for every rail station you have and so the first one is built in say Berlin second one is placed in the captured you know uh, Paris perhaps third one is built in Western Germany and that way you can increase your capacity and still spread out your your what you have to defend it makes it a little bit harder for defending all that armored train is next so uh, they can defend against aircraft at two they can defend uh, they have a hit point of one uh, just like a casualty like a unit has a hit point of one infantry unit they move eight and they cost eight so this is basically similar to what historical board gaming has for armored train so that's nothing new there now I want to state that everything has all my other units land air sea they have an anti-air value they have an anti-sea value and they have anti-land value usually or anti artillery you know or first strike you'll see it when it gets to that point but you'll have infantry don't defend at four against aircraft they defend at two against aircraft just as a, a key you in for that so don't get too alarmed when you see that later on trace move path ammunition resources supplies is there ammunition so ammunition would stand for like the atomic bomb or other kind of uh, you know, uh, biological weapons perhaps resources supplies research sharing oil and strategically moving units all use lend lease rule and ship base hopping rule so ship base hopping was up top there and we'll take a quick look at that moved from destination that de designated origin to designated destination via shortest viable lend lease route every fifth sea zone must be a friendly naval base and subject to interdiction by enemy combat air patrol units and service warships and submarines I want to quickly state too that in Operation Winter Solace the game that we just concluded not too long ago a month ago now <laughs> I had never any difficulty with lend leasing anything to anybody uh, and that was despite having like eight German and Soviet subs at one point maybe it was as little as five um, or maximum of five at some point enemy subs in the Atlantic definitely was at least five that's worrisome right you know five submarines in the Atlantic enemy submarines and I still could lend these whatever I wanted to that's crazy that's crazy to me and the so my way of getting around that prior to to version three 
was saying that you have to move everything via, via Lend-Lease route, but since Lend-Lease moves across kind of convoy route systems, it, uh, well, sorry, in this case, let's see, it doesn't state Lend-Lease here, but basically a lot of things, including generals, commanders, move via Lend-Lease and ship-based hopping rule. The ship-based hopping rule means every fifth sea zone must be a friendly naval base, have a friendly naval base. That's the idea there. You have to move things kind of in a, a path that does not just cross into Dead Sea in the middle of the Atlantic to bypass enemy um, submarines. It has to kind of be more predictable and make it a little bit more easy for those enemy subs to get you. That's the idea there. And I could see this needs much more elaboration, should have used much more elaboration. This should have had their own FAQ, but that's what we'll leave it for now. Uranium we'll touch on here. Basically, I'll just say uranium here is similar to what uranium was in historical board game with some minor changes, but I don't, uh, I think this whole thing need to be reworked, so I'm not going to explain it too much. Fortifications are next. So fortifications work interestingly, and I admit this has some flaws. And uh, later on, when it, this is all new stuff, and so it needed some work. But later on, the stuff gets much simpler and easy with less less flaws for sure. I could see a lot of this having some work after having a little bit more experience now with version 3 and, and a different system of doing things. So as you see here, you have an anti-air value, anti-ocean value, um, kind of an artillery strike, hit points, and cost. Over here, this in, in green, once again, is what you get after you unlock a certain tech. The yellow is like the highlight of that unit, uh, you know, the bunkers, the highlight of the unit, a unit is that causes negative one to attacking units. Malice, negative one to attacking unit, and it's all cumulative as well. So fortified line, etc. Bunkers, one dice three, they get that after you unlock the systematized fortifications. They get three dice at two, and they roll at hit points of three, and they cost five. You defend one border, you can upgrade to a line, fortified line for five IBB. I should have stated in here that you could have maximum of one per territory. Maximum of any one of these fortifications, sorry, per border. That's what I should have done. Because people can say, oh, it's cumulative, so I can build, you know, I can build five bunkers on one border, and then I'm, you know, way ahead. My enemy has this cumulative negative. No, it's supposed to be one, maximum of one per border. Fortified line is slightly better, but not by much. It has a, a little bit extra hit points. But it's negative two cumulative for attacking units for one round. So let me quickly say about this too. My theory about fortifications is this. If you're attacking a fortification, your bullets are not that as efficient as they would be. Your bullets are not that efficient. They're bouncing off the concrete. They're, you know, they're um, you know, you're falling into tank tracks, tank traps, so your your tanks aren't as efficient either. You have to watch out for laid out minefields and barbed wire. Basically, you have to, your, your attack is not as efficient. Now, the defender is slightly more efficient as well. They have units that can, uh, you know, duck away from their firing slits. Um, yeah, that's the big benefit for the defender. You don't have to duck away. Basically, that's about it. So, they do have some other bonuses as well, but those are ingrained to the fortification. So the units have this defensive bonus where they don't have to duck away, but the fortified line is represented oops, in this feature here, where they have three dice at two. Now perhaps that should have been increased a bit, but we're still looking at a six damage here in first strike. So that's that's something worth considering as well. First strike against um, anything attacking. So there's a chance of one hit there. I know version three has two dice at five, first strike. This is, uh, so I work out to 10, this is at a 6. But it has a negative 2 malice to any attacking units. And it costs a little bit cheaper too, if I remember correctly. I think a fortified li line in version 3 costs 10 bucks, and here it only costs 8 bucks. So uh, yeah, for one round of combat, the attacking forces is not so efficient. The defending forces is just as efficient as they were before. But they also get this um, attack here as well. Corrections, I would say. For sure, it would need some improvements. Fortresses can only be built in cities and islands, so that's their thing. Um, makes it simple in that case, defend on all borders. It's a negative one malice for all attacking units, just because that you have to spread out your fortress along much, uh, maybe that's not quite accurate to say. Basically, <laughs> it might be a little bit more difficult to defend an island because it's not as, you know, fortified line, you can kind of choose a defensive terrain across this ridge line. 
whereas fortresses you can't necessarily do the ridge line you're doing the whole island terrain be damned kind of thing right or the whole city terrain be damned if it's plains or otherwise and so that's why it doesn't offer as high a malice bonus as this one over here now theoretically you could say since this one is built this one could one could say that this is built on in the city well no it's built on all borders so never mind i was just trying to make up make up something so three dice at two and three dice at three so that's what that occurs so you can kind of get my reasoning behind this i think the benefit behind it perhaps it needs to be boosted up with an increase to the defensive role of three dice at say four perhaps maybe that a solution so you could guarantee one hit but i uh, yeah that's my two cents on the matter coastal guns they operate a little bit differently they defend coast borders and they have first strike versus ships so they have they're they're probably the pound for pound the best defensive unit because they have three dice at three against ships and they have three dice at two against land forces so that's pretty good and that gets three dice at four against ships and three dice at three for a decent cost as well so you could really do some serious damage against attacking naval units and it's a negative one for attacking units for one round so coastal guns are pretty good here uh, again all the higher value stuff is unlocked once you get the systematized fortifications and now we deal with trench work i know rocket base oh sorry defensive work rocket base is not necessarily uh trench work but nonetheless we'll just stick with it okay here we have the same thing anti-air anti-sea first strike hit points and cost so first one will be trench work what did trench worker it's work do it's kind of a holdover from world war one but trenches were dug in um well in world war ii as well even though it was much more of a mobile war but it's also supposed to represent kind of stuff in well uh, if a nation gets bogged down and have time to big trench works so that's when you can build it and that's represented here is maximum one per side contested territory so you can only build trenches when the territory is contested that's to kind of symbolize that the, the fighting got bogged down and now everybody could throw up a defensive work there a trench work there to defend that area so it's negative one cumulative for attacking infantry for one round so it's something that you kind of build within the territory, whereas fortifications are built on the borders of the territory. And so you could quickly throw these up to uh, reduce the attacking infantry down by one for one round. That's the idea there. Slows things down. Because this is World War II, tanks and such, trenches wouldn't do too much to slow down tanks. Sea mine, sorry, minefields. Let's take a look at minefields. Are also something you could build. Ah, oh, sorry, no, let's do sea mines. Sea mines are five dice at two. So that's a chance, you know, 10 out of 12 chance of doing a hit, so that's not too bad. First strike versus assaulting transports, ships and transports. Maximum one on coastal or sea zone border. So you can build them, I should say it has to be a coastal sea zone as well. And you can't build them way out in the middle of the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, but nonetheless, that's what I have written here. <clears throat> Only cost two. So for a price of two, five dice at two is pretty good. You know, you could sink one ship, uh, you know, you're rolling at 10, basically five dice at two, right? You know, that's saying, you know, a decent chance of scoring a hit so you could also but there these mines sea mines and minefields could also be swept with destroyers and light cruisers in regards to sea mines and infantry class units in regards to minefields so they're not as amazing as one would think so minefields function kind of similarly against units crossing the border so uh this is something you would build on uh you know similar to with fortifications so perhaps trench work should be down here by themselves um maximum one on nation's border or coastline so i just look at this here and say okay so what if you had a coastal territory a coastal border a land land border to sea so you can build a coastal gun right uh and since you can't build a fortified line and coastal gun so you just build a coastal gun or a coastal coastal line is probably what i should call it and i should say maximum of one per border so anyways you have a coastal gun so negative one and then you could have uh, trench work. Sorry, you can't do trench work. Sea mines, and then a minefield. That would make any D-Day invasion pretty hairy at that point. You get five dice at two. You get uh, three dice at three, let's say. So, and then three dice at four against ships, and one dice at three against aircraft. That's pretty good. Pretty good stuff as a, a sea line defense, and it doesn't cost you too much. Five, five, two, and two. So that cost you fourteen bucks, and really beef you up, and, and really make that. Um, fortress europe more of a reality last of all we have rocket base so rocket base is unlocked with uh, rocket tech or just maybe it's just called rocket 
So one dice at three against aircraft, you could theoretically target aircraft with them. Uh, one dice at one against land units. So pretty minimal, right? Like, uh, sorry, against sea units rather. Um, it's just hard to target stuff in the middle of the ocean. You know, uh, you're, you're 20 feet off target, you land in the water and you just give everybody a nice bath. <laughs> About it, you know, so it's hard to really zero in on that one. Where again, where again, whereas against land units, it's slightly better at a two. Its best feature is one dice at six against strategic shot. So launch one rocket per turn. So this is unlike HPG's version three rockets, where it's a one, it's a one-time use unit, which I find ridiculous. But it's a one-time use unit. You launch one rocket per turn. You have maximum of one rocket base per territory, so that you don't. Because they could become too powerful, you know. You could put like six in one territory covered by aircraft, and you could be lo bomb London to oblivion. Because you can't intercept rockets. I don't think I list that here, but it's probably written somewhere. You can't intercept rocket. Your range is of two in strategic attack at one d six. Okay, now we have some house rules that we need to quickly cover. Fortifications grant a malice to enemy attacks only across that border. Attackers may flank the fort by, cro by crossing border elsewhere. That's one feature that's difficult in HPGs. If you have a if you have a territory like this, and you have a fortified line here, and you have you know X amount of units here, four units let's say, and you have uh, you know three dudes here, let's say four dudes here, and two dudes here, you want to and you want to maximize your chance of bringing as many units as possible. As soon as you bring one unit from this side, all these puppies get a plus two defense, and the fortified line gets two strikes at five. You know, it doesn't matter if you have, you know, whatever, even if you have five here and only attack with one across this border, all these guys get a plus two, and this fortress gets that two shots at you uh, against that one unit, right? That's it, that's all. So different people have proposed different suggestions. I quite like Rank Carcass's suggestion where you just roll it out slowly, which kind of works, right? Like you roll dice, uh, it would slow down the game, but you roll dice by dice. First you do your first strikes, and say your first strikes take out two dudes. And each round you go, okay, one, two, three. Okay, so we got three dice and two hits, right? So you take out those two. And now this remaining one rolls only one dice at normal rates without this plus two against these forces here. So his idea works quite well, and and I like that. It's just um, adds time added, adds a little complexity and enjoyment. Uh, it adds a little bit because there's some realism there, but I'm not sure it 100% does the trick. My version of the rules here with the fortifications, you would kind of bypass that issue. You know, if you had you know four units here and a fortified line here against you know three units and then uh you know another three units coming here, it's simple because the malice is all on these guys. So the fortified line fires its three shots, boom, 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 uh, and they're rolling at uh, two, so likely only one hits or whatever, if that. So one hits, you take out these ones, and these ones suffer a negative two malice, let's say, if they're attacking those territory, and these ones are at full rates, and then these ones are at full rates as well. About it. So one feature I would add, perhaps, is perhaps you should say a fortified line gives, uh, a, if you pair an infantry class with a fortified line, say three for three, uh, then each infantry defense also gets a plus one. Maybe that's what would work out as well. Basically, perhaps the infantry should have a defense of one, but only against this border. But that's why I try to avoid giving the defensive units a plus one and do it only the the fortified line itself, giving the extra strikes, you know, extra three dice at or whatever it is. That's all there is. That's what I was thinking about. I think that works the best. And thereby, you leave your defensive units alone, and the fortified line takes care of the rest. These ones attack, suffer negative two, these ones wouldn't, done, resolved. So this rule here, that's basically to say these ones here don't suffer any negatives. You could flank that fort and don't suffer negatives. Land and sea mines cover a single border on land and sea, and engage when an enemy or air, army or navy is crosses the border. So perhaps I should say land, sea, and land and sea mines, as well as fortifications, cover a single border. Both sides on a viable field may place landmines when in supply, and sea mines when with a transport, a raider, or a cargo plane. Minesweeper capable units may forfeit their attack roll to sweep mines 
If unswept, the mine then makes its defense roll, and if successful, is removed. So it's a one-time shot. It's kind of a munitions unit, I suppose. One-time shot. If it misses, you take it off the board. Done. Here I talk a little bit about radar. Radar extends the airfield scramble in the areas adjacent to radar. So you can scramble the areas adjacent to radar, uh, only if you have an airfield. <laughs> Allows scramble at night and to enemy combat or non-combat move. This basically states the same information that was over here in regards to radar. It says it a little bit more wordily, but I had the space here, so I thought I'd throw it in. That's the idea there. It just squeezed it in here. And that takes care of page four. So we saw some house rules here uh, and some more clarifications of both land and sea mines. We saw defensive work and how that functions. We saw fortifications. I've gone over some of the improvements I would change since then, but basically the system of how they work. Rail work, I think that's important in World War II to have extra mobility. We saw this trace path move. It's not very clearly said, but it should be moving. All land lease should be moving along convoy routes. That's one thing that I see after the fact that I should have clarified a little bit more. Submarine pens and their benefit, and there's a few things I would have changed with them as well, but nonetheless, there we have it. Naval shipyards are also decent as well, and I've talked about how I would improve them slightly now. Then we have supplies, nuclear stuff, bases, and all the unique stuff about them. We have also factories, and I've covered kind of the benefits of certain features behind the factories. You know, the, the plus one from every factory I think is quite nice. Then you could actually have, um, you could actually increase your nation's capability of fighting without spending, without expanding. You don't have to be as expansion. I think makes sense. Of course, if you buy a major factor, you're never going to make up for the cost of it during the course of the game. Probably. It will be really difficult. You know, it'd take you seven turns to make up for the cost of that factory. So you're not going to go out of your way to build major factories to pay up for it. I mean, there's more than seven turns. There's like, was there 19 turns in Global War 36 version 3? 17, 19 turns, somewhere there. So yeah, you would you would definitely get two major factories paid for themselves, let's say, in the course of the game. And so theoretically, a person can do that, but you're not going to profit too much from it. So basically, you're going to be building your major factories where you need them to build units, and uh, it's just an added bonus. That's the idea behind there. Okay, that takes care of that, and uh, I think that's it for this one. Thank you all for watching. Cheers.